My name is Skip Orif. Uh, I'm the owner of Father and Son Lawn Solutions. Uh, we're a company that basically what we do is we, we treat lawns um, with, you know, fertilize, insect control, weed control, things like that. Um, I've been doing this kind of work for about the last 25, 30 years. So I've become very familiar with, with uh, lawns in this area and, and what they need and the problems they have and the different, different ways to go about correcting those problems. Uh, you know, not all lawn problems can be solved with chemical applications, um, especially in this area. It takes more than just treating the yard to uh, keep the grass viable. As, uh, as we were talking earlier before everybody came in, you know, grass is not supposed to grow here in the panhandle of Florida. Uh, Mother Nature never intended it to grow here. If you look at any undeveloped piece of land, um, you know, what's growing there, you'll, you won't find any turf grass. You know, you'll find pine trees and scrub oaks and palmettos, um, but you won't find any grass. So what, what we need to do uh, in order to keep a healthy lawn, keep a, a good, nice lawn, is we need to be very proactive at what we do to keep the lawn viable because if you just take a hands-off approach and do nothing, the grass will decline. On the other hand, uh, the other problem I see is that, um, the two problems I see, one is that, you know, people just let their, you know, kind of take a hands-off approach and uh, maybe water the lawn, but not a whole lot else. And then after four or five years, the lawn has declined and a lot of weeds have come in and, and, and the lawn is in really bad shape. The other problem I see is just the opposite, and that is people have a tendency to over-maintain their lawn, and that's just as bad as under-maintaining it. What they'll do is they'll just out of, out of just being very conscientious, they'll love their lawn to death, and, and they'll treat and fertilize and water and just baby it to the point that it declines. So what we're going to do is, you know, we'll talk about all these things and uh, talk about, you know, the proper way. Maintaining your lawn here in this area is kind of like walking a tightrope. I mean, putting enough down uh, as far as fertilizer and, and treatments to keep it healthy, but not putting too much down. The same thing with watering. You can underdo or overdo any of it. And so we'll talk, talk today about how to just keep that fine line, uh, keep, you know, keep on that fine line and, and not go off one side or the other. We're also going to talk about what you need to do in addition to applying treatments, um, which are things like top dressing, aerating, dethatching. All those are very important as well at keeping the, the lawn uh, healthy over the long term. So what, uh, what I'd like to start with this morning is just talking about what you need to be doing with your lawn right now. I mean, it's, it's, we're right on, the, right on the, uh, the, the precipice of spring and the grass is starting to turn a little bit green and we're gonna be coming into the growing season here. So what is it that you need to be doing right now? Um, I can tell you the one thing you do not need to be doing right now is putting down any nitrogen-based fertilizer. One of the problems that um, people encounter here is that, you know, they just get too anxious about getting their lawn green in the spring. Let me tell you, you know, getting your lawn green in the spring is not a race. It's not, you know, whoever has the greenest lawn on the block, the earliest is not the winner of the race. They're, that's the person that's going to have problems with their grass declining a few years down the road. Um, soil temperatures play a very important part in the grass's ability to actually absorb and use the nutrition that you put on the lawn when you fertilize. Um, when soil temperatures are below 80 degrees, the grass just does not have the ability to absorb nitrogen and other nutrients that you apply. So if you apply fertilizer right now, when the outside temperatures are in the 50s and 60s, the soil temperatures are probably about the same. Most of that fertilizer that you put down is just going to go right down, 
is just going to fall right down through the root zone and keep on going and the grass isn't going to absorb it. Um, you may get a little bit of reaction from it, but not very much at all. Consequently, if you go out and pay $30 for a bag of fertilizer, you've probably thrown away 25 of those dollars because the grass just isn't going to benefit from that fertilizer that you put down. The other problem with fertilizing uh, this time of year um, and the grass not absorbing it is the fact that when, that when that nitrogen and all those nutrients go down past the root zone and it's not picked up and utilized by the grass, those elements have to go somewhere and it's either going to be on down into the soil and, and reach the aquifer or it's going to be washed off and reach one of the bodies of water around here and we, we just, you know, we don't want that to happen. Um, the state of Florida has actually <coughs> become aware of this and, and they're proactively uh, at trying to educate at least the, the um, professional green industry, letting them know, hey, you know, you need to wait until you put fertilizer on the lawn because we, you know, because it can have a negative effect on our water resources. So when, when is the best time to apply fertilizer to the lawn? Um, generally speaking, rule of thumb is, you know, most people don't have a, a thermometer to stick in their soil to tell them exactly when the, when the soil is 80 degrees. So if you just use a couple rules of thumb and wait until you've cut the grass at least twice before you apply any fertilizer. You're not going to do the grass any harm by delaying fertilizer application. The only thing you're going to do is benefit the grass because as you know, when you wait uh, to apply the fertilizer, it's just going to be able to absorb and utilize all the fertilizer you put down. So um, one rule of thumb is to wait until, the, uh, until you've mowed the lawn at least twice. Second rule of thumb would be to wait until the, the temperatures, the air temperatures are 85 degrees and above. Um, Dr. Brian Unruh, who is like the, the grass guru at the University of Florida, uh, has a date of um, April 15th before he recommends putting out any, any fertilizer on the grass. So if you just keep in mind tax day, you know, if you don't fertilize before tax day. Now, I, I specifically remember last year, April 15th, the weather was still kind of cool. So as far as what we did with the lawns we were treating, we, we delayed it even a little beyond that because the, the temperature was still cool and uh, the grass wasn't going to be able to benefit from the fertilizer that we put down. But, you know, uh, generally speaking, time-wise, um, somewhere between the latter part of April and the early, early part of May is a good time to uh, apply fertilizer. Okay, just take a moment, any questions about, about that? Yes, is that true for any type of grass? Yes, that's true for all types of grass that we grow in this area. Okay, the other thing that would be very beneficial for you to be doing right now is to be applying a pre-emergent weed control for summer weeds. Um, I've, I brought a, a few examples of products that you can use for, for different things. This yellow bag right here is a, um, is a bag of pre-emergent weed control. It's called Prodiamine. Um, it's, it is formulated with a little bit of potassium fertilizer. That's potassium is fine to put on the lawn right now. It's not nitrogen. It's not going to simulate it to grow. It's going to help build the root system. So right now we have a temperature uh, window where summer weeds are going to start germinating. And what a pre-emergent weed control product does is, is any summer weeds that um, have dormant seeds lying in the ground, when those seeds start to germinate based on temperature and moisture conditions in the spring, that pre-emergent weed control will shut down that seed and stop it from germinating and, 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 and basically cause it to die before it ever becomes a, a full-grown uh, full plant. Um, 
one of the one of the weeds that is just prolific in this area and and that uh, propagates from the seed that the pre-emergent weed control is is very helpful to control is chamber bitter um, if you're familiar with chamber bitter it's a, it's a little weed and it looks like if you know what a mimosa tree looks like it looks like a baby mimosa tree and then if, if, you, if you pluck one of those weeds and look on the under, underside of that weed, it has all these rows of weed seeds um, up, up under it. Chamber bitter uh, propagates um, completely from seeds. Some, some weeds propagate from rhizomes, which are underground runners, which pre-emergent weed control does not do much to control, but any weeds that propagate from seeds, it is gonna help control those. Um, and chamber bitter. Now, one thing about chamber bitter, <clears throat> specifically about chamber bitter, is it germinates kind of in late in spring, around around the end of April to about the middle of May is when it germinates, and then it starts showing up, actually coming up around the end of May to early June. So what you want to do is time your application of pre-emergent weed control to, if, if you want to specifically catch chamber bitter, you have to time the application of pre-emergent weed control to catch that germination window. So what I would recommend that if you were going to apply pre-emergent weed control for this spring is go ahead and apply, um, uh, read the directions and figure out how much you're gonna need for, the, for your yard apply half the amount now and then wait about a month, five weeks from now, and then apply the other half. Because by doing that, you'll elongate the effectiveness period of the pre-emergent and it'll go into that time of, um, of controlling chamber bitter and, and, um, and uh, other, other types of weeds. Prodiamine or um, Pendimethylin is the other uh, pre-emergent product that, that we have found from experience is a, is a really good effective product for controlling chamber bitter as well as other grassy type weeds. It will also control crabgrass. Um, crabgrass propagates from seed every year and if you have a crabgrass problem in your yard, prodiamine or um, pendimethylin is, is going to be good at controlling, at controlling that. Control the chamber bitter? Um, yes. It does? Yes. So I, where I, do you get these other two that you mentioned? Okay, uh, good question. The, the products that I have here, uh, most of them can be, uh, can be uh, gotten from um, Ewing irrigation. Let me, go, let me go back to fertilizer, okay? And this, this is kind of one of, my, one of my pet peeves about fertilizer is that Scott's has done an excellent job marketing their fertilizer as a brand. Um, because a lot of times people will ask me, you know, what, what brand fertilizer should I get? Um, and, you know, really the brand makes no difference. Fertilizer is fertilizer. And Scott's has done an excellent job marketing themselves as, you know, the, the the, the name that you look for on a fertilizer bag. However, the, what, what they, the, the actual ingredients they have in that bag are really not good for your lawn. Um, I, I, I brought a bag of Scott's here so that you can see. And this, this is a Scott's, you know, Scott's bonus S, what, you know, a lot of people will use on their lawn. I went into a uh, Home Depot yesterday, as a matter of fact, and as soon as you walk in the front door, there's this huge display with all these pallets of Scott's fertilizer, and they're talking about, you know, they have this really pretty picture of, you know, well, if you fertilize your lawn twice a year, it'll look this good, and four times a year, it'll look this good, and six times a year, it'll look this good, you know? And that's true to an extent, but let me kind of explain to you how that works and why that's not a, a really good thing to go on. Um, way down at the bottom corner of this bag, kind of where you can barely see it, um, there's three little numbers. 
And those numbers right now uh, on this bag are 29010. What those numbers represent is the percentage of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium that this bag of fertilizer contains. So I think this is a 17.2% uh, two four pound bag okay let's just let's just make it make it easy and just just assume that we had we had 50 pounds of, of fertilizer here if we had 50 pounds of fertilizer that means there would be 14 and a half pounds of nitrogen no phosphorus and five pounds of, of potassium in this bag if it were if you put out 50 pounds now why is that not good well um, nitrogen is the main product that causes the grass to grow and turn green. I mean, if you put nitrogen on your lawn within a few days, man, it'll be dark green and you'll be mowing that thing, you know, every, you know, twice a week for the next month. I mean, it'll just grow, 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 grow. And you'll think, wow, this is really great. You know, I've got this beautiful lawn and, you know, I, it's so thick I can barely push the push the mower through the grass and it's just, you know, and, and, you know, probably during that time, your neighbors are going to come, be coming up to you and going, man, what'd you do to your lawn? Your lawn looks so great, you know, and people will be driving down the road honking at you, you know, and I mean, everything, you know, you're just, you know, you're going to be like elated at how nice and beautiful my lawn is. And if you, if you do that, you know, if, if you do what they say four or six times a year, boy, it, that's exactly what will happen. However, what they don't tell you is that whenever you, whenever you put the fertilizer on there and you're stimulating top growth, you're doing that at the expense of root growth. So the grass is putting all of its energy into growing, growing leaves and runners and, and all that and it's looking really nice on the surface but if you could see underneath the ground the roots are just getting fewer and fewer and fewer and fewer so what happens is after three four five years of doing you know following the scott's plan of you know fertilizing six times a year four times a year whatever they recommend then you end up with a top heavy lawn that feels like carpet when you walk on it and you can barely push the mower through it, but it has hardly any root system and it just ends up collapsing. You know, have you ever heard the, the ever heard people say, well, you know, if you have centipede grass, you gotta replace it every six, seven years? Well, that's one of the reasons that, you know, that happens is that that's, that's a perfect example of over maintaining a lawn where you know, and, and again, unless you come to a workshop like this or you do a little bit of research on your own or you talk to the county extension agent, you're not going to know. You know, you're going to walk into Lowe's or Home Depot. You're going to see that pretty little sign and you're going to go, oh, well, if I want a nice lawn, this is what I need to do. And that's what so many people do, but it doesn't, it, it, not for this area. You know, uh, I think Scott's is based in Ohio. And probably if you did that up in Ohio with Kentucky bluegrass, it would work fine. But here with Centipede, St. Augustine, Zoysia, it doesn't, it does, it is not a healthy thing to do, um, to fertilize your grass that much, that often. Um, I've gone to some, some lawns um, to, to look at them and, and to, you know, kind of diagnose a problem. And what I found is, <clears throat> is that the, the lawn, literally, the grass is so thick that I can grab it with my hands and literally, and the, the grass is so thick and the roots are so shallow and so few, I can literally grab the turf and peel it back like a carpet. And it just almost sounds like Velcro, you know, when I do that, because it has been fertilized so it it has so much nitrogen has been put on the on the lawn for so many years that there has been so much top growth developed but no root growth that there's just no you know there's nothing left for the roots and the lawn is starting to collapse um, <clears throat> for um, 
Now, the, you know, the, the, let me talk a little bit about nutrition in general for the lawn because, as I said, the, the Scots here is 29010, so basically it has 29% nitrogen, no, no phosphorus. Most of the fertilizers that you <laughs> will buy over the counter from Lowe's, Home Depot, from your big box stores, will have little or no phosphorus in them. And there's a reason for that. The reason is down in Central and South Florida, there's an abundance of phosphorus. There's too much phosphorus in the soil. As a matter of fact, if you put phosphorus on the lawn down in Central and South Florida, again, you can have the same problem we have up here. If you fertilize too early, it'll contaminate the aquifer and run off into bodies of water and create ecological problems. We don't have that problem here. The problem that we have is there is no nutrition in the soil. I mean, we just have sand. There's no nitrogen, there's no phosphorus, there's no potassium, there's very little of anything. Okay, so phosphorus is a very important, it's one of the three major nutrients that the grass needs to be healthy. So if, if you put down a fertilizer that has no phosphorus in it, then you're denying the lawn one of its major nutrients, which it, it has very little to access in the soil. So what you need to do when you fertilize is you need to fertilize with a fertilizer that has phosphorus in it as well as potassium. Phosphorus, phosphorus is, a, is a very, um, it does a lot of stuff. The, the plant uses it in a lot of different ways to grow and, and um, um, you know, uh, just just do its process. So you need phosphorus. So you need to look for fertilizer. What I have here is an example. This 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 bag came from Ewing. This is a, a bag of fertilizer, and it's 14, 14, 14. Okay. So what that means is basically whether a a, a um, fertilizer is 14, 14, 14, 10, 10, 10, 6, 6, 6. It it as long as the numbers are all the same, it means there's it's equal amounts of phosphorus, of, of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And that's the kind of fertilizer that, that we need in this area because our our soil is doesn't have any nutrition in it at all. Um, so you need that that one 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 ratio. Now I I recommend the 14, 14, 14 because it just gives you a higher percentage of everything when you buy the bag. I mean, you'll pay about the same amount of money for a 10, 10, 10 as you do a 14, 14, 14, but you'll just have to put less of it out because it's more concentrated. So that's, you know, that, that is the kind of fertilizer that, that you, you need to be putting on your lawn is the one that has a one, one, one ratio. Okay, let me just pause there. Any, any questions or anything? Yes, yes, sir. Is that true? So you want that much phosphorus in a centipede? <clears throat> or you want a lower number? Um, well, for centipede phosphorus, again, um, if we've done hundreds of soil samples in this area, um, and ev without exception, every single soil sample that we've done is low on phosphorus, and then we send those we send those samples in, um, and then they send back recommendations uh, for centipede. Most lawns are, are centipede. And th there's always, uh, you know, two, three, four pounds of phosphorus that are recommended to bring that soil level up to what it should be for centipede or any other. Now, um, centipede, um, centipede is is supposed to be a low maintenance grass. And when what what I mean by that is you're not supposed to use a lot of nitrogen on centipede because centipede is very reactive to nitrogen. It will nitrogen in water. If you, if you water and apply nitrogen to centipede, man, it'll, it'll do what I, what I mentioned. It'll just become a, a, a thick mat of, of carpet. Um, and you don't want to do that to centipede. Phosphorus, on the other hand, won't stimulate that top growth. It'll help it do other things, but it won't so much stimulate the top growth. Yes, sir. Does that ratio 14, 14, 14 vary? Say when you move, I live in Crestview, 30 miles north. Yeah. What you probably want to do is um, take a soil sample and just have it have it analyzed because yeah, I, I would imagine that up in Crestview the soil conditions because there's 
farming up there. I mean, you know, they, they can grow, actually grow stuff up there, whereas down here we can't. So I, I would recommend that you take a, a soil sample and find out kind of what the nutrition elements are there and, and go based on that rather than, um, all the soil sampling we've done has been right along the coast here between Gulf Breeze and Fort Walton. Um, we, I, I haven't done any up north in Crestview and Milton, that area, so I, I, would, I would recommend that you do that. Yes, sir. Where is the pH factor here since, since it's all sand? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. Um, uh, what we'll do, let me talk about pH here for uh, a moment. <clears throat> get, the, get, the, get the question a lot of times, well, we'll when, how often should I put lime on my yard? You know, why um, should I, should, and when should I put lime on my yard? What lime does, lime is not a nutrient, but what lime does is it raises the pH of the soil. So why would you want to raise the pH of the soil? What benefit would that give to the grass? What pH does, what the, what the proper pH does is it allows the grass to easily absorb the nutrients that are in the ground or the fertilizer that you put on, on the grass. If the pH is too far off, if it's, if it's, if it's way, you know, uh, way off and usually, um, again, out of all the soil samples that we've done in this area, uh, I can't remember a single one that's ever been too high. In other words, that it's been um, too basic. They're all too acidic. The lower you go, the lower the number on the pH scale, the more acidic it is. And any of the ones that we have, um, any, all of the soil samples that we've done, if they're not uh, correct, then they're too low. So the way you correct a low pH uh, soil is to add lime to the soil. Um, and unless you do a soil sample, there's, there's really no way to tell exactly where the pH is in the soil. You really need to do a soil sample um, and, and, and find out if you need lime. Now, if you do need lime, um, it takes about 50 pounds per thousand square feet of lime to change the soil pH by one point. So generally speaking, in a soil pH, the grass, the grasses and you know, the, the warm season turf grasses that we have, the centipede, St. Augustine, um, they like about a 6.5 to 7 pH. Seven is neutral, so anywhere from neutral to slightly acidic. Um, so if, say, you have a, a pH that's 5.5 and you want to raise it one whole point, you're going to need about 50 pounds of lime per thousand square feet on your lawn. So, I mean, just to extrapolate that out, if you have a quarter of an acre, which is about 10,000 square feet, then you're going to need 500 pounds of lime to apply to the yard to raise your pH one point. Um, so it seems like a lot. That's, that's 10 50-pound bags is what that works out to be. Now, when you apply that, the lime does not instantaneously change the soil pH. It takes about two or three months for the lime to be absorbed by the soil to do its thing and for the pH to actually change. So if you applied lime and a week later took another soil sample, it would probably read about the same because the, there wouldn't be enough time for the, um, you know, for, the, for the pH to change in the soil. You need to give it about two or three months to do that. Um, and, and one, you know, I mean, one interesting factor is, you know, the pH, uh, the pH scale is actually based on a logarithm of, of 10. So a pH of 5.5 is actually 10 times more acidic than a pH of 6.5. And a pH of 4.5 is 100 times more acidic than a pH of 6.5. And I've, I've seen some pHs that, of soil samples that we've done down around 4.2 or, you know, 4.5. It's, they can get that low. Um, so, you know, in that range, that, that soil is 100 times more acidic than what it should be. And you're going to need, you know, a 4.5 pH, you're going to need to move it two whole numbers. So that's going to require 100 pounds of lime per thousand square feet. To change that pH. <clears throat> and how long does that last? Good question. Um, 
you should, if you, if you do that, it should be good for several years. Um, you know, you shouldn't have to add lime more than, a, you know, once every three or four years. And you can do soil tests. Now, the thing that, that moves the pH down uh, usually is if you have trees in the yard, oak trees, pine trees, you have a lot of leaf drop. <laughs> Um, as those leaves decompose, then the, th that's what changes the pH of the soil. If you have a yard, say for instance, one of these yards that, you know, it's, it's a newer home, they cleared the lot completely, brought in, you know, three or four feet of sand, planted the yard on top of the sand, then you probably don't have a problem with pH. But in a yard that's been established for a long time, that you've got a lot of shrubs and you know, or you've got a lot of trees and stuff planted in the yard, oak trees especially that you drop a lot of leaves and those leaves have been worked into soil over the years, that's the kind of yard that probably has a, a pH issue that would need to be checked. Yes, sir. Where do you get the soil sample done? Um, good question. You can, there's a, um, what you can do is you can go to the county extension agent. They are, um, they have like a satellite office down here at the uh, county courthouse extension on 98 and Gulf Breeze. Um, they have soil test kits um, and then you can get those soil test kits from the county agent and, um, and uh, send them off to the University of Florida and then the University of Florida will check all the, I think the county agent can do a pH test by itself, you know, just a pH test at their facility, but if you want the pH along with all the nutrition um, analyzed, then you'll need to send it to the University of Florida and, and let them do it, and they'll send you back a, a printout and it'll tell you how much lime and how much you know, of each nutrient you need. When you take a soil sample, the best way to do it is take just little samples from around the yard, like in front and back, probably three or four in the front, three or four in the back. Take them about two or three inches deep, so, you know, about where the root zone of the grass is, um, and then just put them in a bag and, and kind of shake it up just so you can get an average of everything. I mean, it's, it would be very unlikely that the front yard and the backyard would be so different that you would need to treat it differently. Um, so, you know, unless you have an extraordinary large property, several acres, you know, you wouldn't, you would, in just a normal residential lawn, you would, you would treat, uh, you know, the same front and back. If the grass is more acidic, like you say, what is the result on the lawn? If, if, the, if, the, if the soil is more acidic, um, generally speaking, the lawn just will not thrive as well. Uh, very rarely would you see the lawn decline, actually get sick and decline from having a soil pH problem. Um, but uh, what, what you'll find is the grass just won't thrive the way it should and it, it won't be able to uptake the nutrients that it needs. The uh, lime can be applied any time of the year. Um, there's not one ideal time to apply it. Uh, so any, any time during the year you can, you can take a soil sample and apply lime. Um, and, and if you do if you do do that, be sure when you purchase the lime to get the pelletized lime and not the powdered lime, because powdered lime is just very hard to put out in a spreader. And if you're putting out several hundred pounds of it, it'll it'll just it, it'll just be really hard to put it out in the powder form. But they do make a pe pelletized form that is like a fertilizer that will that you can easily put out with a with a spreader. You have to water it in right away or? You don't have to water it in right away. It, it does need to be watered in eventually, um, but it'll, it'll break down and just kind of mix in with the soil. You, you don't need to water it in right away. Let's talk about the different kinds of grasses because I get that question asked a lot. What is the best type of grass to grow? And uh, what, you know, what, you know, if you're gonna resod your lawn, um, you know, what kind of grass should I install? <laughs> Uh, in my lawn, and is there a best grass for this kind of area? Um, actually, all grasses that we grow in this area do have strong strengths and weaknesses. Um, there's not one ideal grass. There's 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 some that are lower maintenance than others that have fewer problems, but they all have you know some kind of strength and weakness to them. Um, the most common kind of grass that we have in this uh, area is centipede. 
Um, the reason centipede is more common here than anything else is simply by default because that is for, for many years the grass that most of the sod farms in this area within trucking distance grew. So uh, that consequently that's why most of the homes that were constructed got got uh, in, got centipede installed in their lawns because that was the cheapest kind of grass because that was what the sod farms were growing that were close by. If you go down to central or south Florida, all the sod farms down there grow St. Augustine. Consequently, you see more St. Augustine down there because that's what the sod farms in the area are growing. Here in the last five, 10 years, sod farms have started to diversify a lot more. Um, they've started to grow zoysia, which is a really good grass. I really like zoysia and I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit, why I like it so much. But um, as far as, you know, the, the, the different attributes of, of the different types of grasses, um, centipede is an okay grass. Um, one, of the, one of the main things about centipede though, and, and I try to tell people this up front because a lot of times I'll talk to a new homeowner and they just got this new house and uh, they're, you know, they're just really happy with it. The sod, the, the, the sod is newly laid and it's, you know, it's okay, but it's not really, it's not really nice yet. But, you know, they, you know, they'll say something like, boy, I just, I want my grass to be lush and green in the envy of the neighborhood. You know, what they're asking for is they're asking for a trophy lawn, okay? Um, and I just have to tell them, you'll never have that with centipede. Centipede is not your trophy grass. You can try and make it your trophy grass, your trophy lawn, but by doing so you'll kill it because it is not, it will not tolerate high maintenance. It will not tolerate a lot of fertilizer. It won't tolerate a lot of watering because it'll, it'll create, it'll, it'll create a lot of thatch and then the lawn will eventually decline. And many of the problems that I, I encounter with talking to people with centipede lawns is they have, they have tried to over maintain their lawn and, and just in doing so caused it to decline. Centipede is meant, is, it's, is, is kind of, you know, one of, one, of the, one of the nicknames of centipede is, is the poor man's lawn because it's not meant to, you know, it's not meant to be maintained at a very high level. And you know it's not meant to be fertilized a lot. One fertilizing, one one nitrogen application per year, is usually good for centipede. Now there is an exception to that. Let me just kind of throw out a caveat to that generality. Um, if you have a brand new centipede lawn, and it's not very dense, and you can look down and the, you can see the the individual pieces of sod where they're put together, and and there's a lot of dirt in between the runners you can, under those conditions, go ahead and, and give it some extra fertilizer for one growing season and, and kind of get it to, to become more dense and fill in. And then after it gets to where it's, it's a fairly decent lawn, then back off. You know, centipede, again, because with, with, with new construction, most of the time they bring in fill sand which has no nutrients in it and they lay the centipede on there. The centipede will survive on that on that basically you know beach sand but it won't thrive until you start giving it a little bit of nutrition. Um, so what you can do with a brand new lawn once it gets established you don't want to put any kind of fertilizer or herbicides on a lawn until it gets established at least to, you know, give it at least two months during the growing season. If it was installed in the fall or winter, you want to wait until it's, you know, the following growing season and give it a couple months to get established before you start putting any kind of uh, fertilizer or herbicide on it. You can use insecticide if you have like fleas or ants or something like that you need to treat. Insecticide isn't going to hurt new sod, but fertilizer and herbicide will damage new sod. So, once the lawn gets established, um, you can give it a couple really good shots of fertilizer and get it up and growing and, and kind of get it, you know, get it to become more dense, water it a lot, and then once you get it to that point, kind of back off. Um, centipede by, by nature is kind of a pale green to kind of a yellowish color. That's what it's supposed to be. Again, a lot of times people will look at that 
look at that and, and, and go, oh, you know, there's something wrong with my grass because it's not dark green and keep fertilizing it and keep it that dark green, you, you don't want to do that with centipede. Be, understand that it's supposed to be a light to a kind of almost sometimes a yellowish green color. Again, I refer back to the, the marketing that goes on at, at, at the big box stores and all the little, you know, nice, pretty little displays that, that tell you, you know, for a darker, greener lawn. You know, every, everybody that sells lawn products, they start off with a phrase, for a darker, greener lawn, you know, fill in the blank. But the thing is, is centipede, you don't want it dark and you don't want it, you know, dark, you don't want it darker green because if you make it darker green in the long run, that's unhealthy for it. Um, centipede, along with all other warm season turf grasses, grows laterally as well as, as vertically, so it will spread, it will, you know, like if, you know, uh, I, I get a lot of questions at this time of year where maybe over the winter there's been areas of the lawn that have declined a little bit, and you have these empty patches, and, and people say, well, you know, should I get some seed and throw in there? How sh what should I do? If, if there's no other factors that are that's causing that lawn that that area to decline if it's just you know over the winter decline from wear or whatever um, once the grass starts getting you know gets up and growing and and starts moving laterally it'll it the the edges of of that bare spot will start to migrate in to that bare spot and, and fill that bare spot so you really don't need to do anything unless you want to get some grass plugs just to speed the process up and install grass plugs and, and, and get it to fill in faster. Um, centipede, uh, centipede does not require, uh, it, it's somewhat drought tolerant. Uh, it doesn't require a lot of water. Uh, it is possible to overwater centipede. Again, if, if you know, by overwatering it, it'll stimulate too much top growth. Um, another uh, another factor of centipede is that it is not shade tolerant, very, very shade tolerant. It, it will tolerate a little bit of shade, but um, overall it's not a real shade tolerant grass. Um, one of the biggest pests that you deal with in centipede grass is mole crickets. Mole crickets love centipede. Um, they'll eat the roots and they'll eat the runners of centipede so that, you know, if you have mole cricket activity, you'll just have these brown grass blades laying on the ground and you just pick them up and there's no root or runner or anything attached because mole crickets have devoured them. Um, as far as uh, St. Augustine grass. You know, for a long time, St. Augustine was our only other alternative to centipede in this area. And if people didn't like their centipede, that's what they would go to, is they would go to St. Augustine. St. Augustine's a relatively good grass. It has a darker color than centipede. It has um, a little, little um, coarser texture than centipede. Some people do not prefer the coarser texture of St. Augustine. They just don't like the way it looks, but you know, that's a personal preference. Um, St. Augustine is the most shade tolerant variety of grass that we can grow in this area. It will tolerate shade better than any other type of grass. However, it is not shade proof. Um, a lot of times, you know, I'll have a, I'll talk to somebody with a, with a St. Augustine lawn and they'll, they'll have um, maybe here's here's a typical scenario. They'll have a St. Augustine lawn that's been in place for several years. They'll have some trees in the yard. Um, these, you know, maybe some big oak trees or something. And um, and they've, they've lived there for 10, 15 years. And under these oak trees, the St. Augustine has started to decline. And they'll say, well, you know, back when I moved here, or even five years ago, the grass was doing fine there, but now it's, it's not. Well, what, what, what happens is, is over time, the, the canopy of the tree closes in and it becomes more dense, lets in more, less light, and you, know, you, you, and you get to a, a tipping point where the grass just does not have enough light to stay viable and it starts to decline. So St. Augustine, although it is shade tolerant, it, is, it, it still needs some daylight in order for it to survive. 
Um, usually about four to six hours of direct sunlight is, is what St. Augustine requires to, to stay viable and stay healthy. Um, there is one pest that is particular to St. Augustine um, that, that doesn't affect any other type of grass that we have here in this area, and that's called a chinch bug. Um, a chinch bug is a tiny little bug. It's about an eighth of an inch long. Um, you can find them if you dig around in the thatch area of the, of the grass uh, that's affected and, and seem running around if you, know what you, if you know what you're looking for. I mean, they're real fast, and, and when you expose them, they, they, they run to shelter real quick, try to bury themselves into the, the sheaves of the grass. And what chinch bugs do is they extract the juice or the, the moisture from the grass. And if you have St. Augustine that's being affected by chinch bugs, it'll actually look like the grass is drying up and it's not getting enough water. A couple ways that you can tell the difference, if you have a St. Augustine lawn, a couple ways you can tell the difference between chinch bug activity and just plain drought stress, where the lawn is not actually getting enough water, is when you have chinch bug activity, you'll have brown grass that's drying up right next to lush green grass that's, being, that's not being affected. If the grass was drought stressed, you would have an even brown over the whole area that was, that was being affected. You wouldn't have lush green blades right next to brown dry blades. Um, another way that you can tell is you can kind of feel the soil. If the soil, if, if, you, can, if you can scoop out a handful of soil and, and compress it in your fist and it holds together, then it, it's moist enough for the grass to grow. If you compress it and let go and it just falls out and, you know, and just, just dribbles out, then the ground is too dry and it's causing drought stress in the lawn. Um, one other way that you can, you can identify chinch bug activity is you can take a, a round cylindrical container like, like a, a coffee can that's, that's open on both ends. You can, you, and if you have an area that you suspect chinch bug activity, put it over an area that's, that has both ground, brown and green grass in it. <laughs> and, then, and then as you're kind of holding the, the container onto the ground, pressing it down, fill it with water and let the water fill up. If there's any chinch bugs in that area, they'll float to the top and you'll see them swimming around on the top of the water there. That's how you can identify if there's any chinch bugs uh, in the area. Chinch bugs can work very fast and they're sometimes hard to control. They, because they, they kind of force themselves down into the sheath of the grass where if you, if you make a treatment, they're kind of protected. So sometimes it takes two or three treatments to, to control them. Um, another thing about chinch bugs is they like very hot areas. Like, um, like areas, you know, usually you'll find chinch bug activity close to the road or a driveway or a sidewalk in areas of direct sunlight where it's just really hot. Very rarely will you ever find them in a shady area. They like hot areas. <clears throat> So if you have a St. Augustine lawn and you have an area out by the road, has direct sunlight all, all, all the time and is starting to decline, you can suspect chinch bug activity. Chinch bugs are typically active between maybe late May and the end of August or into September, the hot time of the, of the, of the season. Um, the other thing about chinch bugs is you can't really do anything to prevent them. You can only treat them once they're active. The reason is, is because when you put the, put the treatment on the grass, um, the chinch bugs stay in the upper, you know, above the soil in the thatch part of the grass. And if you treat that and then you water, irrigate, or, or it rains, it's going to wash that treatment away and leave the grass unprotected again. So, it's not really practical. You know, you might think, well, if I, if I have St. Augustine, I'll just, I'll just spray it with, you know, I'll just spray it at the beginning of the year. And, but that won't do any good because that, that treatment will just be washed away. So you kind of have to be vigilant, watch the grass, and treat it when you, uh, when you see that activity. Um, another, an, another kind of weak spot of St. Augustine is, is that it has a tendency to be susceptible to brown patch. Uh, that's a disease 
And we saw a lot of brown patch activity this winter, especially in St. Augustine, because for a certain period of this winter during December, the, gra the, the weather was warm for winter. It was in like the 60s, 70s, which is, which is the ideal temperature window for disease activity. It was in the 60s and 70s, and we were getting rain. So when you have a combination of that kind of 60, 70 degree temperature window, <laughs> along with rain. It's ideal conditions for a disease to become active, and we saw a lot of that this year. Um, the, what that looks like is, it looks like circles in your lawn, and sometimes just perfectly formed circles, or like serpentine shapes that, that will grow and move. And a lot of times you'll see the circle, and it'll start out small, and it'll grow, and then as the, that circle grows, the grass in the middle of that circle will start to regenerate and it'll look like a donut. You'll have green in the center with a kind of a band of brown grass around the green circle. Um, fortunately, uh, the, the brown patch does not affect the roots or the runners of St. Augustine. So typically like this winter when we had disease activity, this spring, when the grass starts to um, starts to grow again, those areas that were affected that were brown uh, through the winter from the disease activity will start to regenerate, and, and the leaves will start to grow back. So you know, at least it, at least that's good. Um, another thing about St. Augustine is is it's not as susceptible to mole cricket activity as centipede is. The runners of St. Augustine are a lot more fibrous. They're less palatable to mole crickets. Mole crickets don't like them as much. Uh, they will eat the roots, but they'll usually leave the runners alone. So you don't have as much problem with uh, mole crickets in St. Augustine grasses as you do with, say, centipede. The best time of the year to treat for mole crickets is in May. Mole crickets have a one-year life cycle. They, they hatch out in March, April time frame and then develop from a, a hatchling to an adult between, you know, probably by about July, August time frame, they're, they're full grown adults. Um, so consequently, if you put down a treatment in May, then you're putting down the treatment after they've hatched, but before they have become adults. What makes mole crickets so difficult to treat is number one, they stay underground. There's no way to, usually there's no way to get a direct contact between the mole cricket and the insecticide. So what you have to do is you have to apply the insecticide on the ground and then water it in to force it down into the soil to affect the mole cricket. The other thing that makes them hard to treat is that they are a large insect. So it takes a higher concentration of insecticide to actually kill them off, especially when they become an adult. Um, the other thing that makes them hard to control is the fact that they don't stay in one place. They move around, they can fly up to a mile or two, they, their, their wings, so that they can move around. So as far as an ideal time to treat them, yes, May is the ideal, ideal time to treat. However, they can be active literally all year round. I mean, I've, I've seen mole cricket activity throughout the winter time. And, and we, you know, when, when we visit, you know, our, 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 the lawns that we take care of throughout the winter, a lot of times we'll see mole cricket activity and we'll need to treat it. So just because it's not springtime doesn't mean you shouldn't, shouldn't treat mole crickets if you see them. Uh, mole crickets will eat the grass year round. They, the, 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 the um, juveniles and adults all feed on grass roots and uh, they, you know, they, 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 they feed year round. Now they will be less, the colder the weather it is, the colder the weather, the less active they will be. Just like any insect or, or cold blooded animal, you know, the colder it is, the, the slower they move and their metabolism slows down. So you don't have the activity that you would have in the spring and summer, but they can still be active. Um, a couple, couple interesting uh, biological controls that the University of Florida has been working on for the past decade or so is they, 
Mole crickets, uh, the, the, the damaging type of mole crickets that we have are not native to the United States. They actually came from South America on cargo ships in the holes of cargo ships. Back, way back when they used soil as ballast for cargo ships, they came, you know, the cargo ships would come from South America, they'd unload their cargo, and then they would unload the ballast onto the shore of the, the port and the ballast, the soil, contained these mole crickets. Um, and then the mole crickets, I, th I think it was Louisiana, maybe, where they, where they got started. And then they just started spreading from there. So mole crickets, you know, consequently, you know, over years became a real pest, not only for homeowners with lawns, but also for, uh, say, ranchers who had cattle that were, you know, trying to grow, grow grass to feed the cattle. The mole crickets were eating the grass. So... The university started started studying mole crickets, and, and they went actually went down to South America where they originated, studied them down there, and what they found out was that down in that area there was two parasites that um, was down there that actually kept the mole cricket population under control. Um, one of the parasites was a um, a wasp that would. Uh, paralyze the mole cricket, lay, lay its eggs on the mole cricket, and then those eggs would hatch out and, and it, would, it would kill the mole cricket. The other parasite they found was a little nematode, um, a, a microscopic little bug that, that, would, um, that used the, the mole cricket as a host and, and would kill the mole cricket. So what they did is they identified those two pests, brought them back to the United States, released them in, into uh, our environment, and, you know, so far, they, it seems like they've been able to establish since those two pests have, mole cricket parasites have been able to establish themselves and have, you know, they've identified that they have actually helped control the mole cricket population in this area. However, they're, they're still a problem. They're, they haven't controlled it to the point that they're not, uh, not a problem to, to the homeowner. Okay. Um, the trouble is your neighbor doesn't treat it, so they just run over there for a while. <laughs> True, and if you live near a golf course, then you really have to fight mole crickets because, like, you know, the golf course over at Hidden Creek or Tiger Point, they, they cannot tolerate mole crickets on their greens. You know, mole crickets will mess up your putt. Um, you know, they're little tunnels, you know, so, so they have zero tolerance for mole crickets. They're constantly treating, so the mole crickets just move to the nearest, next nearest safest place, which is usually the adjoining homes around the, the fairways. So, um, any questions about St. Augustine or Centipede at this point? Mole, what are you going to talk about moles? Moles, okay, well, all right, let's take a moment and talk about moles. <laughs> I do not have a silver bullet for moles. I wish I did. Um, moles are just a really, you know, moles, moles, in case you're not familiar with them, are, the, are a mammal about the size of a mouse or a rat. They're really weird creatures. They live underground and they tunnel through the, the earth and they eat insects. One of, the, one of their favorite insects to eat are, are earthworms. Um, so a lot of times I get, I, get the, I get the question, well, you know, can't you just kill all the insects in the ground and, and drive the moles away because they, you know, just by killing all their food source? Well, the thing is, is, you know, it's just, it's really impractical to think that you can kill all of the insects in the soil. It's just not going to happen. And even if you could, you don't want to because a lot of the insects there are beneficial, like the earthworms. So treating the ground with insecticide is really not a practical uh, method for getting rid of moles. There's, there's, there's three different avenues of treatment for moles. Um, one avenue is, is poison. The other avenue is traps. And then the third avenue is um, electrical, electrosonic devices. Um, out of those three, the one that I've heard people have the most success with are the sonic devices. And, you, you know, they're little stakes that you put in the ground. They're solar operated, and they, they supposedly ping and drive the moles away. I've had a lot of people tell me that they've had success with that. Um, and 
from, from what I understand from talking to people, the way they have success is by using several of them at a time and kind of, you know, taking an area and cordoning it off with, with the stakes and kind of moving the moles, you know, away into the neighbor's yard. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. A dog, yeah, yeah. You know, and you're lucky if, if you have a, my, yeah, Tom, Tom has a dog that, yeah, that takes care of his moles. I have a dog that goes after the moles. My problem is she never catches them. You know, so she digs up my yard. I mean, she, she's so funny. She'll go in and stick her nose in the, in the burrow, you know, and you'll think she's just right on top of it the way she's acting. And she'll dig up 50 feet of tunnel and never come up with a mole. So, you know, and, and she'll think she's really done something special. Yeah. So if you've got one that's good enough to actually catch the mole, more power to you. Yeah, um, you know, uh, that's, that's a form of poison. Mole poisons come in several different forms. They come in little like jelly worms and little pellets and different things. If you're going to try and use the poisons, um, the best way to use it is it, don't, don't touch the the product because the mole has a very strong sense of smell and he won't you know he'll he'll smell your your scent on that and reject the bait so use gloves um, poke a little hole in the top of the tunnel and drop the poison in there the key to doing it that way is to identify the active tunnels and the exploratory tunnels because if you have mole activity, some of the tunnels will be main tunnels, main active tunnels. There'll be corridors that they use all the time. Some of the tunnels will be exploratory tunnels that they just go out and come back and you only use one time. The way to identify the difference between an active tunnel and an exploratory tunnel is to go out one morning and look for fresh tunnels and then push them down with your feet come out the next day or even that afternoon and look and see which ones are pushed back up. And the ones that are pushed back up are the main tunnels and those are the, that's, those are the places where you want to put the poison if you're going to try and use poisons. Other than unsightly, do they actually damage the <coughs> It, you know, a lot, of mole act, mole, a lot of mole activity in a concentrated area I've seen does up, unearth the grass enough to cause it to decline. I don't see that very often. You know, usually it's just a tunnel here and a tunnel there, and, and it doesn't cause a lot of damage, um, but it's, it's possible. Yeah. Potentially the mole crickets. Yeah, right, yeah. That would be good. I don't know which would do more, if, I don't know, but that would be good. Um, the, other, the other type of uh, device is, is a trap. Uh, and it's usually a spring-loaded device that basically the idea is you set it over the tunnel and when the mole passes through the tunnel then you know it, it skewers them. Um, I've, I've had people you know I've had people tell me that they they've had success with all all the different one all the different types of mole you know mole treatments uh, the but the one I've heard the most is the is the is the electronic devices? Um, I've even heard one of them. I've heard that some people swear by is juicy fruit chewing gum. Um, you may have heard that one. I heard another one recently. I can't remember what it was, but that person swore by that that it was kind of did the same thing. You know, supposedly the juicy fruit messes up their stomach and kills them. Um, you can you can try that. Okay. Um, okay, getting, getting back to the different types of grasses. Centipede, St. Augustine. Um, oh, let me s say one other thing about centipede. Well, I'll, I'll save that for later. Um, <coughs> zoysia and Bermuda are, are, are the two other types of grasses that we have in this area that, that grow well. Um, actually, I like both those grasses. Um, Bermuda, to me, is, is the is the most indestructible grass that you can grow. Uh, it, it survives just about anything. It's very forgiving. Uh, you, you can, with, with Bermuda and Bermuda only, you can fertilize it four or five times a year and it'll, it'll tolerate it. Um, and it'll grow thick and green and, 
and it won't it won't decline from over maintenance. Um, you can use it's very herbicide tolerant. You can spray it with herbicides. There's as a matter of fact, there's certain herbicides that Bermuda grass will tolerate better than other grasses, and you can you can use them and just clean up all the weeds and have a pristine lawn. It it takes a lot of work to do that, but but you can get it to where it's you know that's that's why golf courses use varieties of Bermuda grass usually um, in their in in their uh, facility in their in their uh, in their course because it's so tolerant to maintenance. Um, one of the things that Bermuda will not tolerate, though, is shade. Um, Bermuda is not shade tolerant. You, you have to; it has to have direct sunlight the whole day, or it will not just it will not be dense. Um, it will grow under shade, but it'll be very you know it won't it won't be very dense at all. Um, and Bermuda, Bermuda, uh, a lot of times you know mo probably the majority of the lawns that we have around here have a little bit of Bermuda in them. It just volunteers on its own. Um, at my house, I have an area that's probably, at, I have a couple acres, and there's probably an area equivalent to at least a quarter acre where Bermuda volunteered and just spread, and it's not irrigated. Uh, it's, you know, we just treat it periodically, but I really don't do anything. We actually drive over it, but it's, you know, it, it does well. So um, I like I like Bermuda. Um, now some people don't like the fine texture of Bermuda, and it, but other than that, um, it's it's not a bad grass. Um, zoysia, if if you want the trophy lawn, and if you want the thick green, dark, lush lawn that's a trophy lawn, zoysia is it. Zoysia gives you just really thick, dense. It's a nice dark green color, a really lush lawn. Now fortunately, <clears throat> here in the last five, seven years, sod farms in this area have started to grow zoysia. So it's, you know, before up until five years ago or so, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't very available and not very many people used it. Now it's becoming a lot more popular, more sod farms are growing it, and it's just, it, it, you're seeing a lot more of it. Um, as far as as far as weaknesses, I mean, zoysia is it, it it's it, it has some shade tolerance, so you can grow it under shade. It's not quite as shade tolerant as St. Augustine, but if you have some shade, it will grow in shade. Um, it's relatively resistant to mole cricket activity. However, mole crickets will will eat it, but it, it's so thick, it's just, it stands up good to mole cricket activity. Um, it's so thick that it does a really good job at out-competing weeds. Um, you, there will still be some that break through, but, you know, it, it, it not nearly as many as in other types of grasses. So overall, zoysia is, is just a really, really nice lawn. Um, it does, it does have a tendency, kind of like St. Augustine, to have disease activity at certain times of the year. But that's, a, again, a relatively minor problem because it only affects the blades of the grass. It doesn't affect the, um, it doesn't affect the roots or the, the runners. Um, one, of the, one of the things that both Bermuda and Zoysia have that St. Augustine and Centipede do not have is they have a feature called rhizomes. What rhizomes are are underground runners. Um, St. Augustine and Centipede only have stolons, which are above ground runners. So consequently, their Saint um, Zoysia and Bermuda are a lot hardier because they have above ground runners and they have below ground runners. They have two ways of of reproducing themselves. So if they do have an issue, a problem, whatever, they're a lot more resilient at, at uh, recovering. Whereas like if, if you have a, a, a St. Augustine or a centipede lawn have a problem and all the above ground runners die, then the lawn is just, it's gone in that area. You know, it will not regenerate if those uh, stolons die. However, with Bermuda and St. Augustine, they have, this, they have the um, rhizomes 
And if, if a certain part of the lawn has a problem, it declines, then those rhizomes are still there and it can regenerate from those rhizomes. Can I ask you a question? I have zoysia. Mm -hmm. I've got two different kinds. I've got the old empire and mm -hmm. I've got the new floor tam or whatever, oh, okay. University of West Florida. Uh, now I see a distinct difference in the texture. Mm -hmm. How high are you or how low are you supposed to mow those? Yeah, that's a good question. Yes, there are different varieties of zoysia, and basically the difference is in the, in, the, in the thickness of the grass blade. Some have a finer, skinnier grass blade, and some have a thicker grass blade. The thicker ones look more like, almost like centipede, and the thinner ones look more like kind of Bermuda. But as far as an ideal mowing height for zoysia, about two inches would be a good, good height for both of those varieties. That would probably be a good happy medium. There's other more exotic varieties of zoysia that they use on golf courses that you know can be mowed really low, but for a for a residential lawn. But it doesn't hurt to leave them a little longer. No, because no. You, my yard man curses me up and down because it's hard to cut. Okay. okay. Yeah. So he right. he prefers to leave it a little taller. So uh -huh. he just trims off the top. So I'm not going to hurt it by. No, you're not going to hurt it by leaving it longer. So, you know, and, and as, as while we're talking about it, let's just talk about mowing heights for a moment and talk about why, why mowing heights are important to grass. Um, <clears throat> okay, so the way the grass plant works is it, the, the blade, if you can picture the gr grass blade as a solar panel that collects light and energy and it takes that energy down into the engine room and it uses that energy to grow more grass blades and grow roots. Okay, so when you're mowing the grass, you're actually removing some of that solar panel and you're removing some of the grass's ability to collect energy to do what it needs to do to multiply and, and grow and be healthy. That's okay up to a point. However, Again, it kind of depends on the variety of grass, but generally speaking, if you're talking about centipede, St. Augustine, well, let's just talk about St. Augustine and centipede. If you're cutting, that, cutting off too much of that solar panel every time, you're, you're inhibiting the grass's ability to absorb sunlight, which is energy, which it uses to grow roots and grow more, more foliage. Um, especially St. Augustine. St. Augustine should be left left high. If you cut St. Augustine <coughs> short all the time, the grass is going to decline. Um, and the reason they, they recommend that you specifically St. Augustine be left higher, if, if, you, if you were to take a runner and just hold up a, 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 a one foot section of runner of St. Augustine and then pulled up a one foot section runner of uh, centipede, on that runner, you're going to have so many grass blades on the St. Augustine runner and on the centipede runner. Well, there's going to be more grass blades on the, Saint, on the centipede runner than on the St. Augustine runner. St. Augustine has fewer runners. The, runner, the, the blades are spaced out farther on the runner than on the centipede, so it has overall fewer blades in it, so it needs more leaf surface to collect the same amount of light than, say, centipede does. Does that make sense? So that's why cutting it shorter is harder on St. Augustine than it is, say, on centipede. Centipede, two inches is a good, is a good mowing height for centipede. And for zoysia, two to three inches, anywhere in there. However, you know, um, a longer, you know, leaving it a little bit longer doesn't hurt as long as it doesn't get so long it starts to thin out. You know, I mean, that would be, that would be a situation where you just weren't mowing at all. But if you're, if you're doing regular routine maintenance, um, if, if you want to leave it a little higher, that it, it doesn't hurt it at all. Um, Bermuda, you can cut a little bit shorter because it's denser. The you know the 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 leaf, um, uh, the number of uh, little blades and leaves on the runner is denser, so you can leave it a little. You know you can cut it shorter. It'll tolerate a shorter, shorter cut. Um, it's a really good idea to keep your mower blade sharp throughout the growing season, um, especially again with St. Augustine because St. Augustine the blade is a little thicker, a little wider. If the blade isn't sharp, 
when you go over St. Augustine, it's more like taking a club and just knocking off the top of the blade rather than taking a knife and slicing it off. So if you look at a, look at a St. Augustine grass blade that has been cut by a mower that has a dull blade, it'll look jagged and it'll be brown on the top. Same way with zoysia. Zoysia is the same way. You got to have a sharp grass blade or sharp um, mower blade to cut zoysia <laughs> on because it'll turn brown on the top and it'll it'll kind of, you know it just won't look very good. Plus what it does is it leaves the um, leaves the grass leaves that jagged edge is, is leaves leaves the grass blade open for disease to come in and, and infiltrate that grass blade. Um, so that you know that, that there's some um, information on mowing. Um, any other questions at this time? Yes. If you have centipede now and want to switch over to like soy shit, mm -hmm. I've seen grass seed out there, or is it better to go in and just take everything out? Because I've heard the soy shit will just grow and then eventually kill all that out. Yeah, good question. Okay, so if you have, a, you have one kind of grass, you want to convert it over to another, What's the best way to do that? It kind of depends on what kind of grass you start with and what grass you want to convert to. Um, the most common conversion is converting from, say, centipede to St. Augustine. Um, it's re that's, rel that's a relatively easy conversion to make. Um, and the way that the easiest way to convert that without taking everything up is to just get some St. Augustine plugs and plug in the centipede and the St. Augustine will eventually co-mingle with the centipede and, and kind of take over the centipede. Um, zoysia, however, is, isn't converted that easily. One of the things about zoysia, one of the characteristics about zoysia grass is it grows slowly. Um, and I've, I've had customers that, that try to do that conversion and I had, I had one that actually took, not plugs, but actually squares of zoysia sod and kind of checkerboarded his yard with this zoysia sod when he had centipede. And three years later, you could still see the checkerboards. I mean, it just, you know, it, it didn't work very well because it, zoysia just grows really, really slow. Um, I, I Beg to differ though, it does work because I did a section of mine and I just used, that's why I said I've got the empire and then I got the sod in another section. And putting what I did, I pretty much top dressed. I ra I put the, the zoysia into and, and with fresh dirt, uh -huh. then had it a little higher than the centipede, completely covered the centipede with top dressing and within a year it had filled in. And I put them about 10 inches apart. Okay, all right, that's, that's very good. And the difference there is the person I'm talking about didn't use any sand. All they did was just plant the sod in the middle of the centipede lawn. That would be the way to do it. Converting one yard to another, you, you know, it's relatively easy to convert centipede to St. Augustine by plugging. Zoysia doesn't work very good by plugging other than, you know, I mean, if you, if you do what she did and just top dress everything, put the, with sand and, and, and put the, put the new, new grass on top of the top dressing, that would work pretty well. Um, really what you need to do in order to convert to, if you want to convert to zoysia grass, is if you didn't want to kill everything off, scrape it up and put down zoysia, which would be the best thing to do, then just do what what she recommended a little at a time, just covering it with sand and doing it a section at a time, that, that would work. Um, seed, you mentioned seed. Seed is not a very viable option for establishing or, or doing anything with grass. You, you know, it's really a waste of time and money. I mean, there's, there's two grasses that we grow here that seed is even available for, that centipede and Bermuda. Um, centipede seed, you can get it to germinate, but it has, you have to get just the right temperature and moisture conditions. It has to be really hot out, like in the 80s and 90s, and you have to keep it watered, and it may or may not germinate. And it's very expensive. I don't know, it's probably $40 a pound or more, I'm not sure, but it's, it's expensive. And, and, and even if it, you do get it to germinate, it's gonna, be, it's gonna take a long time for it to establish and turn into a yard. 
Um, Bermuda is a little bit easier to get to establish from seed, but it's still, you know, it's, it's still not a surefire thing. Really, the best way to establish a lawn is with sod or plugs. Um, and, and the thing I tell people, you know, about establishing a lawn from seed, if, it, if, it, if, you, if you could do it reliably around here, then the builders would do it. You know, because that would be the cheapest way the cheapest way to get a yard established is with seed. If, if it could be done that way, then you would see builders doing it instead of buying sod. But it just, it's just not a very, very reliable way to, to, get, to get grass to grow. Um, is there a time of year to put down sod? Not really. Um, how, you can do it year round. Um, if you do it in the winter, the sod that you get will be dormant, but that's okay. It'll still be alive. You can put it down. Just make sure it stays moist. You, you, during the winter, you only need to water it maybe once a week, um, if that, because you don't want to overwater it because you can get a, a disease activity in the new sod if you overwater it during the winter. And um, so the best thing to do is just put it down. I, I, I had some sod that I put in my yard probably about November, December time frame. I haven't touched it as far as watering it or anything, and it's still doing well. I just looked at it the other day. Um, and here and then, you know, it'll probably start coming out of dormancy in the next few weeks and, and, and it'll do fine. Um, so you can install sod any time of year. If you choose to do it in the middle of the summer when it's really hot, that's when you just need to be, be very diligent about watering it. You, you'll need to water it probably twice a day uh, in the middle of the summer if we're not getting any rain just to keep it viable, to keep it from drying out and, and dying but it can be established any, any time, you lay at any time of year. You are putting the sod down on sand, not good dirt or anything. Yes, when I, when I talk about laying sand, sod is putting it down on, on sand. Yeah, here, and here's, let me, here's, here's another thing I get asked a lot, you know, well, if, if I resod, should I bring in a load, of, a load of topsoil and put the topsoil down before I put the sod down? The University of Florida actually did studies to find out, well, is there really a long-term benefit from, from putting topsoil on top of sand? Do, do you get any kind of benefit from that? And what they found was all the good stuff in the topsoil actually fell down through the sand past the root zone within a matter of months. So there was no long-term benefit from using topsoil versus sand if you were going to put something down, a material down before you put down grass. Um, the, other, the other problem with using topsoil is, is that you many times introduce a lot more weed seeds into the lawn that you didn't have before. So really, and, it, and it's more expensive. I mean, it's, it's not as readily available and it's more expensive. So the best thing to do, if you're going to put down some kind of a material on the lawn before you put down sod is just get a load of just fill sand. Um, it's readily available around here. There's a, a sand pit right up here in Holly. You know, it's, it's $150 a load, you know, about for an 18 yard load. So, you know, and you, you know, the fact it, it won't have any nutrition in it, but you can fix that with a bag of fertilizer. So don't worry about putting down soil that already has nutrition in it. You can put down sand and then add the nutrition later when you need it. Yes? How thick do you put the sand? Well, it kind of depends on what your purpose is. Um, if, if you, this is, this is another thing we run into a lot of times. How thick do you put the sand before you resod? If you have areas that have trees close by and there's a lot of root competition, from the trees, then you want to build, you know, put a two, three inches of sand to cover that root competition because we'll talk about this later. We'll talk about, you know, there's, um, when, you're, when you're growing trees and grass in the same soil space, the grass always suffers because the trees will come in and take up the soil space and won't leave any room for the grass. So you want to put down two or three inches of sand on top of the, the root competition from the trees. If you don't have any and the sand is loose and there's no, you know, there's no divots or areas you want to fill in or anything like that, then you really don't need to add any sand. It's not necessary. Okay. Yes, sir. What about if you have areas where you've had disease or, or 
dead grass in there and it's bumpy in there. You can, you can top dress those areas with sand and fill in the divots. Well, if you're spreading it on top of grass that's still viable, you want to do it maybe about, about a half an inch. Rule of thumb is, is if the grass blades are sticking up through the top of the sand, then it's not thick enough to smother the grass and the grass will grow up through the sand and on top of the sand and, and, and fill it in. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I have large <coughs> palms. I just have two of them. Do they have a bad root system that interrupts the grass? No. Palms generally, the, the roots on palms never get bigger than your finger. And it's just like spaghetti, you know, and they, they don't, they're not real fibrous and they're not, they're not hard wood like, like oak trees or pine trees. And they usually don't cause problems competing with the grass. As far as irrigation is concerned, this is what, this is the rule of thumb that I like to give everybody is that your irrigation system is a safety net to keep your lawn out of drought stress. That's the purpose of it. It's not a crutch to prop your lawn up, but it is a safety net to keep it out of drought stress. So, <clears throat> the best way to water, if, if you have the time and the, you know, you want to take the, you know, effort to do this, the best way to water your lawn is to just let it get the rain that it gets, and then in between rain events, when you see the lawn start to get drought stress, turn on your irrigation system and give it enough water to, uh, to get it through that period until we get more rain. Okay, now, I understand a lot of us don't have the time or energy to do that, and you know, we get busy and we don't have, we can't walk around the yard and, and, and check it out every few days, make sure it's doing okay. But the, the rule of thumb is, is that what, the less water you give the lawn or, or let, me, let me rephrase that. Um, the more you space out your irrigation water events, the, the deeper root system you're gonna, go, you're gonna have. Because as the lawn begins to dry out, the grass is gonna start to hunt for water and grow deeper roots to pull that water out of the ground. So um, the best, best thing to do is if you want to take your irrigation and set it and forget it, then um, during the summer, Usually every other day or every third day is a good frequency to set the irrigation system for. Um, during the winter, it doesn't need any. Normally we tell people to turn the irrigation system off in November and don't turn it back on again until March. During that time, you can drain the pump um, so that it, you don't have the possibility of the pump freezing, cracking, and, and you have to uh, replace, replace the pump. Um, it's better to put down more water less often than less water more often. So if you have your irrigation system uh, set, it's better, it's better to put down, say, 45 minutes of water per zone every two or three days than it is to put down 15 minutes of water every single day. And, and really never should you water it more than once a day unless it's brand new sod. That would be the only exception. The, if you leave the top half inch of the soil moist all the time, that's where the roots are gonna stay. But once that top half inch or so starts to dry out, then again, like I say, the roots are gonna start growing deeper and you're gonna end up with a stronger root system which overall will give you a healthier lawn. As far as the, um, the, the time of day to water, the best time of day to put water on your lawn is, is at, in the early morning hours when the dew is still on the ground. The reason for this is you don't want to extend the number of hours during the day that the grass is wet, which creates a favorable environment for fungus to develop in the yard. The other reason is, is if you water during the day, you get a lot of evaporation from the sunlight and, and it's windier, you don't get a, a the, the distribution of the water is not as good. So I normally recommend like between 2 a.m. and 7 a.m., 8 a.m. Is, is the time window that it's good to set the sprinkler timer for. Okay, any questions about irrigation? Yeah, finish by eight. Finish up by eight because usually that's about the time of day that the, the dew will start to burn 
burn off the grass. Okay. Um, okay, let's, uh, we'll, we'll talk about post-emergent weed control uh, here for a little bit. Um, we've already talked about pre-emergent weed control, how you should be putting on pre-emergent weed control right now on the lawn. Um, and it's best to break it up between putting half an application on right now and half an application on later on. Um, I had a question during the break that, you know, that, um, why, you know, why doesn't pre-emergent weed control work sometimes? And pre-emergent weed control will work on weeds that propagate by weed seeds, but the key is, is if you're going to use it, you need to read the directions very carefully and make sure that you put it out according to the directions as far as the number of pounds per square feet of the product that's recommended to control the weeds. I mean, they formulate these products very precisely, and if you don't use them the way they have prescribed you to use them, it's just like taking medicine. You know, if you only take half the amount of antibiotic that you're supposed to take, it's not gonna work. Same thing with the pre-emergent weed control. Um, if, you, if you only put down half the amount that they recommend, then it's not gonna work. If you put down more than they recommend, it's probably going to damage your grass. So you need to make sure that you know exactly how much that you need to put down and put down that prescribed amount. Um, last week I was talking to somebody about this. Actually, they were Facebooking me about it. They had been to the Holly by the Sea presentation I did a couple weeks ago, and they wanted to know about, you know, they said they got some of the some of the prodiamine and and they had a spreader and it had different numbers on it. How should they set the, how should they set the spreader to put it out? And really, um, I couldn't help them with that. But what I told them was, is if, you know, if you can determine how big your yard is, how many, within a reasonable, you know, amount of accuracy, how many thousand square feet you have, you don't have to be exactly right, but pretty close. And then, determine how many pounds, total pounds of product you need to put out. Say if you, if you figure you need, you're gonna need 50 pounds of product, then take the fertilizer spreader, set it on a low setting, and just go back and forth over the yard several times until you get it all put out. That's, that's, that's one of the easiest ways to put it out. You'll, you know, you'll get it out, you'll get it put out fairly accurately don't try and put it out all in one in one application. And by the way, while I'm talking about that, that if you're going to fertilize your yard, that's the best way to fertilize your yard to get an even distribution of fertilizer. Um, every spring, you can drive around the neighborhoods and you can see people's front yards that look like ball fields. They're striped. They're green, light green, dark green, light green, you know. And that's what they've done is they've taken the fertilizer spreader and went up like this, turned around, you know, and, and went back and forth and back and forth, and they didn't overlap the fertilizer. So you can see exactly where the fertilizer landed and where it didn't land. So the best way to put out fertilizer with the fertilizer spreader, first of all, <clears throat> the best kind of fertilizer to spread, there, there's two different kinds of fertilizer spreaders out there. There's a drop spreader that drops the fertilizer straight down. Um, it's kind of a, a rectangular looking hopper. And as you go, go in, it, it, as you go over the yard, it drops the fertilizer straight down. Then there's a broadcast spreader that has a little wheel underneath of it. And the fertilizer falls on the wheel and the wheel just flings it out like that. That's the best kind of fertilizer spreader to use because it it makes a more even distribution and it's, it's just easier to get the overlap. And then when you use that broadcast spreader, the best way to go over your lawn is in a checkerboard pattern. So if you have a front lawn, go back and forth one way and then go back and forth the other way like this. And that way you know you've covered everything. Um, don't try to put it out all at one time. I, you know, and th this is especially, um, especially important if you're using weed and feed, because so many times uh, I'll see people, you know, where instead of having green, dark green, light green, dark green, light green, they'll have dark green or they'll have light green dead, light green dead, 
where they've taken the uh, weed and feed and put it down and it just overdosed it and, and instead of feeding the grass and killing the weeds, they just killed everything because it, it just wasn't put out evenly. Um, I lost my train of thought. Oh yeah, herbicides. Okay, so as far as um, uh, herbicides, you know, post-emergent herbicides, the difference between a pre-emergent herbicide and a post-emergent herbicide, a pre-emergent herbicide will prevent weeds from coming up. A post-emergent herbicide will kill actively growing weeds. So there's um, this product right here is called Trimec. This is a very good general purpose post-emergent herbicide. Um, it, it's very common. You, you can get this product at Lowe's and Home Depot. It has one of the main um, active ingredients is, is 2,4-D. 2,4-D is a very common uh, herb, post-emergent herbicide. It kills a lot of different weeds. Um, this is excellent if you have a problem with dollar weed. This is an excellent product to use on dollar weed. It will just annihilate dollar weed. What was the name of the <laughs> Trimec. Trimec. Or you can, you can write down 2,4-D, which is one of the main ingredients in Trimec, and it's, it's the thing that does such a good job on dollar weed. Um, Yes, it, it, it's good for a number of broadleaf weeds. The difference between a broadleaf plant and a grassy plant is that a broadleaf plant, if you look at the leaf, it has a single vein going down the middle of the leaf and it has branches coming off that vein. A grassy plant has all the veins going in the same direction. Um, and that's the way herbicides are generally categorized as far as they're, they're, they either are designed to only kill broadleaf plants um, or they're designed only to kill grassy plants. So if so like a broadleaf herbicide, that's why you can spray it over the lawn and unless, you know, as long as you're, I always, I always have to qualify this, as long as you mix it correctly and apply it correctly, it won't hurt the grass, but it'll kill the weeds, the broadleaf weeds, because it's designed to kill broadleaf plants. Now, broadleaf plants also include shrubs and trees and things like that, not just weeds. Any broadleaf plant, it will kill. So you just got to kind of be careful. And one thing about Trimec is that, that you have to be careful of. It, it has a rather low volatility, which means that it will volatate. It will, you know, when you... It, it, Particles of this product can be air, become airborne, and some plants can be sensitive even to the um, you know to to the air particles in 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 particles of this in the air. Um, and <laughs> here's another thing: if you use this product in a sprayer, you cannot. If you're going to use the sprayer to spray other pl um, non-target plants later on with something other than weeds, don't do it. I killed my wife's garden one year <laughs> because I had a sprayer that I had, this was several years ago, I had, I had a sprayer that I had used Trimec in and, um, you know, I mean months ago. And, you know, my wife goes, hey, can you fertilize my garden for me? And uh, I'm like, sure, I can do that. So I mixed up some liquid fertilizer, put it in the sprayer, spray the garden, killed her garden. She still remembers it. <laughs> so, do you, yes? In other words, you really can. Uh, I rinsed out my, my weed uh, bottles before, you know, before I spray. I rinsed them out real quick. That was still not, uh, not working. That's all, if you want to try it, you're welcome to try it. You know, I mean, I'm not saying it can't, you know, if you, you know, if, if you want to try and rinse it out, I would, I would do that and then try it on, you know, a non-target plant that I didn't like very much and see, you know, and as long as it didn't kill that one, then you're safe to do the rest of them. Yes, Tom. Yeah, that's a good that's a good question. Um, yes, you can. You just make sure this 
you know, whenever you're dealing with herbicides, especially post-emergent herbicides, you just want to make sure that you're using the right amount because you the these all these post-emergent herbicides, most of them can can burn a lawn or even kill a lawn if you're not careful. Um, so yes, you can use you know one of those garden sparers that hooks to the end of your but into your hose, but I, if I if I did that, I would go way under the recommended amount as far as you know how much you're putting out, and uh, because a lot of these will, if you use less than recommended amount, most of them will still work pretty well. Um, but I would I would I would go way under because those garden garden sprayers are not the, the accuracy of them as far as distribution is is not that that good. Okay. Yes, Trimec, 2,4-D, these, these products. I mean, you can also get it at Ewing, but these products are readily available at any garden store. It's very, very common, um, very common herbicide. Well, uh, that would work on woody things, too. I think, but there's one weed that was shown that was false pine that had been used at the town of Fresno. Yeah, is it, in, is it in the grass, in the lawn? Yes. It, yeah. Yeah, and it's it's got a woody stem. Does it have like little tiny round leaves or round kind of? Yeah, like I said, it looks like it's creeping mm -hmm. time. Is really what yeah. Like, but it's very searchable. Right. And it goes underneath the grass, but eventually it will kill you. Sounds like what it is. It sounds sounds like a weed called Lespedeza. Um It could be that could be it. An, however. There's another product here called MSM, and, and if that weed is less bedeza, that this will do a lot better okay. uh, job on that. MSM is also a broadleaf herbicide, um, but it will control some things that the Trimec won't. I mean, there is no one herbicide that will control everything. Um, you, that's why you have to have kind of a, a number of different herbicides in your, in your herbicide arsenal to control all the different weeds because um, there's some weeds that that some herbicides just won't touch and you have to use a specialty product um, to do it. MSM, now you probably won't find this at Lowe's or Home Depot, you probably have to go to Ewing for this one, but it will control that less bedeza like you're talking about. Also one that you mix or is that brand new? This is, these are all ones that you mix. These are all ones that you'll, you'll need to get like a pump up sprayer and, and mix it. Um, well, this one will control a very, you know, this will kill a lot of broadleaf weeds like the, like the Trimec will, but it also will control like some woody type weeds, like there's a, there's certain weed that we um, control with it called Les, Les Bedeza. I don't, don't ask me how to spell it, but, um, but it's, it is, you know, this does a good job on that. Um, there's, there's two two weeds that are just a scourge in this area and one of them we've already talked about it which is chamber bitter um, the other one that's just really a pain is virginia buttonweed um, if virginia buttonweed is a, a weed it's kind of like you described although it's not woody it's it's a it's a weed that comes comes up and then it just spreads out and virginia buttonweed is one of the few weeds that will just outcompete a healthy lawn um, because it'll just grow up and it'll just push the grass out and and you know if, if you don't kill it or get out and pull it out you know you when it's removed when it's gone there won't be any grass left because it's just pushed all the grass out um, it has Virginia buttonweed the leaves on it it almost looks like a grass it almost looks like a crab grass but it's not it's a broadleaf weed and it um, has uh, you know it's some it's usually green or sometimes has red leaves the leaves are sometimes red and it has a little tiny white flower um, on it and uh, Virginia buttonweed and um, chamber bitter are are controlled well by Celsius um, this is not Ewing doesn't even carry this um, because they don't have it's is made by Bear. Now you can order this through Amazon uh, or online. You can buy it. Um, if you're in Pensacola, John Deere Landscapes. Well, it's called. It's, called one it's yeah, site one or right. one. That's it. Yeah. 
site one. Right. Yeah, right. Um, and I, there's they they have an office. They they have they just opened an office in Fort Walton. I don't know if they're carrying this yet or not. It's over there. And there's there. one in Santa Rosa Beach. And there's one in Santa Rosa Beach. Yeah. Um, this is kind of expensive. This bottle is a little over $100. Um, but it's the only thing, one of the only things that will kill Virginia buttonweed and about the only thing that will kill chamber bitter once it's up and growing. So, um, What's the temperature range that would you apply that? You can actually apply this. I'm glad you asked that question because those other ones do have a temperature range. You can apply this pretty much year round. Um, you got to be a little more careful in the summer applying it, especially on St. Augustine. But you can, you know, we, when we use it, we use it year round. And it does a great job at, at keeping chamber bitter and um, Virginia buttonweed under control. Trimec. Um, can I ask you a quick question yes. about these ingredients, these mm -hmm. things up here? I know a lot of people keep stuff in their garage, and I've always wondered, is the garage too hot to store these, <coughs> to store them in the house? I've never heard of any temperature limitations on storing those. Okay. Um, I just cleared a lot right here in the bar. Mm -hmm. Now, I come across, it's like a vine that was strangling my trees. Mm -hmm. I got it out of the trees, but I'm finding balls or roots, like size of golf balls. What can I do for that? Roots. Are you talking about roots, or are you talking about, like, fruit off the vine? Roots. Roots. Okay, you know, probably like do they, does balls. it, does the vine have thorns on it? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 That's greenbrier vine. Um, greenbrier is, you know, probably if, if you had a landscape, you, you've had green, you've seen greenbrier vine. It's, it's a nasty vine that grows up and it has these leaves, leaves on it. Just, and it usually grows up right in the middle of a shrub and you, you can't spray it because it's in the middle of the shrub and you have to pull it out and it has these potato like roots yeah. on it. Um, Roundup will kill that greenbrier vine, and if it's growing up in the middle of a uh, middle of a shrub or, or a, another non-target plant, the best thing to do is, is is gently pull that vine out of that shrub, lay it on the ground. Put if if it, if 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 it's on the grass, then put something between the grass and the vine and spray it with Roundup. But make sure it stays attached to the root. Because the ground up, the roundup will, you know, the plant will absorb the roundup and it'll go back and kill the root. Roundup does control green briar vine. You can spray if it's growing up the side of a tree. You can spray the roundup right on the tree trunk and it won't hurt the tree as long as it doesn't get on the leaves of the tree. Um, yeah, that's okay as long. Yeah, it's it's roundup will not be absorbed by the tree bark. By the by the trunk of the tree and you can spray the vine on the tree and it'll kill it. Uh, Roundup is only absorbed by leaves it's not absorbed by roots so it's not gonna if you cut it off it's not gonna do any good to spray the ground because if there's no leaf surface that the Roundup is is you're spraying on you're not gonna hurt the plant you know there's not gonna do anything to kill the plant. So it, you have to have leaves, or even that vine, that greenbrier vine. The 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 stem of the vine itself is uh, is green, and and even spraying the stem is going to uh, the, the roundup is going to be absorbed into the plant. But just spraying the ground is not going to help. Okay. Um, so uh, another product here. Uh, we were talking earlier, I think, um, where um, usually this time of year uh, you'll start to see these little weeds come up and they look like really dark green tufts of really fine grass and they'll have, they'll have a stem and they'll have a little soft ball on the top of it, it looks like a sand spur. Um, that's globe sedge or uh, can be nut sedge. Uh, a sedge is actually a different variety of plant than a grass. It looks grassy. Um, and uh, but you know the, it, it it is a different it's it's not classified as a grass. Um, this product image is a good product to control that sedge with. Um, it's it, you can spray it over the grass. You can spray it all year round, um, and you you don't have you know um, you can you can you can spray that sedge and it'll it'll kill the sedge. Okay. Again, uh, Ewing has this. Um, let me go back to the, um, the talking about uh, app, uh, temperature at time of application. Um, Trimec, 
um, is it's especially important that you don't use this in hot weather. Okay, usually 80 degrees and below is it's safe to use this. Um, now I don't recommend you do this at home, but but we you know we've kind of tweaked our formulations to where we use this year round, but it'll it's it's not it's not a you don't don't do it at home, okay? Because you you can easily burn your grass if you if you use that when the temperature is is hot. Um, okay, so for um, for grassy weeds. Um, these these are all these are broadleaf herbicides that will kill broadleaf plants in grass. Grass gitter is a grassy herbicide that will kill grassy plants, but it won't have much of an effect on broadleaf plants. However, centipede grass will tolerate grass gitter. So if if you have say crab grass in growing in centipede, you can use this product grass getter to kill the crabgrass, but it won't hurt the centipede. Any other kind of grass, St. Augustine, Zoysia, Bermuda, grass getter will damage it. Um, but but centipede, it's it's this is a good product to use if you have if you have um, if you have crabgrass growing in centipede. Will it kill torpedo grass? No. Nothing will kill torpedo grass. It, it'll it'll suppress it, okay. it'll suppress it, but it won't kill it. It'll you know you you're probably talking about Vantage. Um, yeah, I can't. I, I'm not look. I don't know. It's in one of those bottles that looks like that. Yeah. Just chemical looking. If yeah, it I, I I can tell you there's nothing that will that will annihilate torpedo grass. Torpedo grass. If you don't if you're not familiar with torpedo grass, torpedo grass. Is a it's a it's a grassy weed. Um, you see it a lot in wet marshy areas. Um, it looks it almost kind of looks like St. Augustine. Um, it kind of has a bluish color to it, and the the stems and grass blades are kind of stiff. Um, but what makes it so hard to control is is that it has extensive underground runners that just go and go and go and go. And if you kill it off in one area, it'll pop up in another, and, and it'll just keep coming up. I've, I've had customers that have had an area of torpedo grass in their yard. They sprayed it with Roundup, killed off everything, waited until everything was brown, scraped it all down, replanted the sod, and it still came back. So um, what, I, you know, what I normally tell people that are dealing with torpedo grass, just you know, the good and the bad about it is, is that... Um, the, the bad about it is, is you really can't, it's, you just wear yourself out trying to control it. You can, there are products that will suppress it, but you'll just have to keep, keep on it, keep on it, keep on it. Um, the good news the is, is... The that suppress it kills St. Uh, Augustine, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Well, s torpedo grass, one of the things about it is, is it, it, doesn't, it doesn't get dense. So it can commingle with your other turf grasses, um, and it won't, it won't, like... It, it, it won't crowd it out. It'll just co-mingle. And if you keep it cut and keep it maintained just like your other grass, I mean, it'll, it'll kind of blend in and you won't really notice it. If you're a lawn connoisseur, you know, and you really like the purity of one kind of grass, I'm sorry. You know, it's just going to be really, it's not, you're not going to, you know, you're going to have to move to get away from it. Um, Can you spray one, one and then go back and spray with the other the same day? Yeah, as a matter of fact, that's a good question. What we do during the summer is we'll take, we'll take these two items because this one's for just to save time because we're going to, you know, house after house after house to treat. So to, so to save time, we'll take this item for nut sedge and this item for, for chamber bitter and and Virginia buttonweed and mix them in the same sprayer. And, and that way, you know, it's a little less cost effective that way, but it sure saves a lot of time going around and we'll mix them together and, and we'll, we'll, you know, so we'll tr treat nut sedge and chamber bitter and, and Virginia buttonweed 
with one sprayer with these two products in it. So you can do that. Um, I'm just trying to think if there's anything, you know, you obviously wouldn't want to mix this with a broadleaf together because that would, you know, you, you would be killing everything then. But um, I think you could probably, I can't, I don't, yeah, I think you could probably, you know, so different, different herbicides have different modes of action. So like for instance, the MSM and the Trimec have different modes of action. So if you wanted to mix these two together to have a broader spectrum of effectiveness against you know, more weeds, you could do that. Um, or if you wanted to just be selective and, and mix, mix, mix a spray of one and mix a spray of other, you could go through and, and do, you know, uh, spray one right after the other if they were in different containers. Okay, yes? Is there any problem with your pets today? <laughs> yeah, good question. Um, what you want to do is after you treat the lawn, just make sure that the, the product is dry on the uh, treated area before you let the pets out. The way these are formulated is they're formulated to adhere to the leaf surface or the plant surface that they're applied on. So um, as far as just pets going out and, and walking on the area or you know kids playing or whatever, it's going to be okay for them to do that after the product is dry. And what is your general dry time depending on what kind of day it is? Yeah, like on a day like today, it would take 15, 20 minutes. Yeah, yeah, it wouldn't, it wouldn't take that long. If it's humid and cold, it's going to take longer, but the hotter, drier it is, I mean, like during the summer, you know, we'll, we'll be treating a lawn and we'll be using the power sprayer, you know, and by the time we're done with the front yard, the backyard is already dry. I mean, so it, it doesn't really take that long, especially during the summer. Okay. All right. Let's uh, <coughs> take some time and talk about um, uh, lawn renovation. Um, because what, what do you do when your lawn gets to the point to where it's just declined, there's not a whole lot of grass left, you're having problems, you know, I mean, it's how do you bring it back, how do you rejuvenate it? Um, because what I, what I find so often is, you know, <clears throat> it's just like, you know, you don't go to the doctor until you get sick, and, and a lot of folks don't call me until their lawn is, is in a severe decline. So once it's in, in, in decline, how do you bring it back and how do you rejuvenate it? Um, usually the causes for decline, I mean, there's, there's a lot of causes for decline, but some of the more common ones are uh, shade and root competition from trees. When you're growing grass in the same soil space as you're growing trees, you know, the trees get bigger, they produce more shade, the roots get more invasive into the soil, they push out the grass, so what you, a lot of times when you have areas with trees, what you have is the grass is declining, uh, because the the tree is tree trees are just taking up soil space and, and light from the from the from the grass. Um, another reason for lawn decline um, is over maintenance. That's a common reason. Uh, just you know, too much water, too much fertilizer over too long a period of time has just caused the lawn to get. Uh, what, what happens is, is when, when you fertilize, even, even if you're not over maintaining, but you're just maintaining over, correctly over a long period of time, as the grass grows vertically, it's also growing runners every year, and over time those runners get layered on top of one another, and you, you come up with a, a very, you end up with a very thick layer of thatch. And so when you walk across the lawn, it just feels like a carpet. It feels like foam rubber. It's really soft and it, it feels good, but it's un a unhealthy condition for the lawn to be in. So under those conditions, what you have to do is you have to go in and you have to tear out those extra runners. And that's done through a process called dethatching. Um, to uh, dethatching, uh, the way you dethatch a lawn is you take a machine called a dethatcher, and I recommend 
renting a power dethatcher rather than using the kind you pull behind a, a, a tractor, a you know, lawn tractor, something like that, that just has the tines that kind of pull at the lawn. Um, a, de a dethatcher, a power dethatcher, will have blades that spin vertically. And as you move the dethatcher over the lawn, these blades will spin vertically and tear out a lot of, the, a lot of that old thatch and a lot of those runners and it'll restore balance to the lawn by um, tearing out some of, the, some of the top growth so that there's not too much top growth for this root system to support. Um, on a lawn that's several years old that requires dethatching, you would be amazed at how much thatch comes out of, of, of an average size lawn. I mean, we're talking you know, dozens, if not hundreds, of trash bag fulls of thatch that you can get out of a lawn that hasn't been dethatched for a number of years. Um, so removing all that old thatch is, is a great thing to do. And then in addition to doing that, going back and taking sand and top dressing that, the, that lawn that you just dethatched to kind of fill in all the gaps and uh, uh, open areas that you've created uh, by going by by dethatching top dressing that lawn and what what that top dressing does it's a it's just one of the best things that you can do to stimulate new growth and the grass will grow the the grass that's left after after the dethatching will grow up through that sand and kind of on top of it and you'll end up with virtually a brand new lawn um, after going through the process of dethatching and top dressing now, if you've got an area that you're, you have a lot of root shade competition from trees, um, you want to raise the canopy of the trees as high as you can to let in as much light as you can. A lot of times with oak trees, what you can do is get an arborist to come in and kind of thin out the canopy of the trees so that um, it'll let in more light. Um, not only is it more healthy for the grass, it's also healthier for the tree to get rid of all of the, because a lot of times if you have, um, if you have branches and leaves underneath the outer canopy of the tree, the tree is actually using energy to keep those leaves and branches alive. Um, and they're using those, those branches on the inner part of the tree are actually using more energy than they're producing from the tree. So it's a healthy thing to do for the tree. So you want to let in as much light as you can and then with all the area of the where where the root competition is around the tree you can do a couple things you can aerate that area because a lot of times especially with oak trees you'll have a lot of just a mat of roots and if you try to push a shovel through the ground it's like trying to push through steel wool i mean it's just so so dense that that root mat is so dense and it's if you can't penetrate the the ground with a shovel, you know, it's, it's the, the, the grass roots are a lot more tender than, than the steel shovel blade. And you can imagine how hard it is for those, those grass roots to penetrate that mat. So if you, if you run an aerator over that, which an, what an aerator does is it, it puts, it puts, it, it, it removes cores of soil and, and root from the ground about the size of your finger. It actually pokes holes in the ground and, and removes those cores, puts them out on the ground, and you end up with, with a lot of, lot of little holes in the ground. As those holes begin to collapse and fill in, it creates a chain reaction to where it creates little micro pockets of air in the, in the soil and it breaks up those roots and it gives the grass uh, a lot, a lot more opportunity to to establish a better root system. Um, in areas of heavy root competition, after you aerate, it's still a good idea to go back in and lightly top dress, because it'll fill in those um, holes with with loose dirt, and again give the grass uh, a good good soil space to root into. Um, by by you, you need to do those kind of things periodically, every few years, every four or five years, whatever, it kind of depends on, on each individual lawn, how, how much, how, you know, how, um, how much, how many trees there are, um, how much root competition there is, what kind of water and, and fertilizer schedule you've been on as far as the, how, um, you know, how much thatch there is. But, but if you do that on a regular basis, 
um, and, and control the, the pests and diseases and those kind of things, you shouldn't ever have to go back and, and completely redo your lawn. Um, I mean, those, if, if, you, if you maintain it like that, um, you know, the, the, fact, the, the, the saying of having to replace your lawn every, you know, five to seven to ten years, I mean, it shouldn't apply to you if you maintain it like that on a, on a regular basis. Okay. No such thing as a perfect lawn in the state of Florida. No, and it, yeah, not really in this area. Here's what I tell people: if if you've gotten your if you've gotten your lawn to perfection to where it's just perfect, enjoy the moment because <laughs> it's not going to last. It's not going to last. <coughs> Take a picture, yeah, so you can prove it to somebody because you know we're dealing with Mother Nature. You know if 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 you have the perfect lawn, you know, a bug is going to find it, disease is going to find it, something's going to happen to mess up that, that perfection. You know, it's, it's, it, it just it isn't going to last for very long. It's, it's always going to be a work, work in progress. It's always going to be. And see, expectations, you know, that's one of the huge things about, I mean, about lawns in this area. Um, and, and we have... You know, because of the marketing of the of the fertilizer companies and the and the lawn companies, I mean, our expectations are way up here. You know, thick, lean, thick, green, lush, but really, you know, those are unrealistic expectations. Um, our, if if your lawn uh, has relatively few weeds, I mean, if the weeds are not choking out the lawn, and and you only have a few here and there. If there's no pest activity, there's no disease activity. If it's relatively thick, I mean, if you don't, if you can't, if you don't look down on it and you can't see bare earth from from this distance, you've got a pretty good lawn. I mean, you, there's not much more you can ask for other than that. You know, if if you want to go above and beyond that, then you're kind of asking for trouble. You're kind of you know courting trouble because if you if you you know. Um, I, I, I had a friend of mine one time uh, several years ago, and he literally got in a competition with his neighbor about who could get their lawn the greenest and the thickest. And he was, uh, you know, he was uh, he was taking liquid fertilizer and running it through his irrigation system on a <laughs> weekly basis. And you know, I mean, this competition he was in with his neighbor was just—I mean, it was out of control. And, uh, you know, so, you know, you don't want to, you, you know, that's just ridiculous. You, you, you don't, you know, you're going to, you're going to end up killing your lawn by doing that. Um, and it's, there's, there's no, no benefit in doing it, no long-term benefit. Unless you're, you know, unless you, unless you're willing to resod your lawn every few years, you know, and just have, maintain the perfect, luscious, most, you know, I mean, but who, who, who wants to do that? Um, Okay. Yes, ma'am. Aside from um, mole crickets, um, regular insecticide maintenance, like as far as centipede grass, shouldn't you? I've been told you should do at least three or four times a year just the cheap insecticide. Is that? You, you know, sure? that's not a bad idea for mole crickets. I mean, the best thing to do. Well. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good question. Mole crickets are about the only lawn insect pests that you can pre-treat for. Um, and really, and any, any treatment that you put down for mole crickets isn't gonna last that long. We use a particular product that, that really you have to have a license to buy. You, you can't, as a homeowner, you can't do it. And we use that for mole crickets and it does a very good job at controlling them for an extended period of time. But unfortunately, you as a homeowner don't have access to that. So what you can do for mole crickets is the best thing to do is to treat in May, like we talked about. If they're there in the yard, you know, that, that should take care of them. Um, and then, you know, to be honest with you, you just kind of have to walk a line between being ecologically responsible and keeping a nice yard. I mean, you could, I mean, if you wanted to go out, just pour insecticide on your lawn every month and just, you know, but it's not really, that's not a wise thing to do. If for no other reason uh, you're, you're going to destroy a lot of beneficial insects and you're also 
And, you know, if there is some uh, unbeneficial insects there, by continually putting insecticide out, they're going to become immune to it after a while. So you don't, you know, that's not, that's not going to be a good situation. So really what you need to do is um, you need to be more proactive in just trying to recognize that, that insect activity. Um, any other insects besides mole crickets, you, you can't pretreat for because sod webworms and chinch bugs, which are the two main ones, you can only, they live in the thatch area of the grass. And if you apply insecticide to that area, it's not going to last more than a couple days if you're going to be watering, you know, during the growing season. So you can't really effectively um, control them. What we tell our customers, if they have a sod webworm issue, you know, we go out and treat it, we let them know, hey, we're going to kill the sod webworms that are here. However, like with sod webworms, they, it has a very, sod webworms have a very short life cycle of about two weeks. So theoretically, we could come in, kill the sod webworms that are in the yard. Our next scheduled treatment is a month later. But if we kill what's there, and Nick, you know, by next week, the rain and irrigation has washed that treatment away, and more moths, which are the adult form of the sod webworm, come in, lay eggs in the grass, they can hatch out in a week. And we, before we come back a month later, they can be eating your grass again. So you need to call us. You need to keep an eye out. You need to, you need to you know, watch for these signs and, and let us know if you, if you see something, because it's just not practical, if not impossible, to keep a, a, a constant treatment on the yard to where thing, you know, it, will, it will kill anything that appears. Um, Yeah, now grubs, we, we have grubs in this area, but they are not so populous that it actually really even causes a problem with the grass. Mole crickets by far are more destructive than grubs are in this area. I mean, you can turn a shovel of dirt and go through it and probably find two or three grubs. That's not enough to destroy your lawn or even cause much damage. Um, but uh, the, the main ones that we have in this area, mole crickets, sod webworms, and chinch bugs. I mean, those are the big three as far as insect pests for lawns that, that, that you need to be aware of. And, and the, the chinch bugs and the sod webworms, you, you have to treat when they're active. You can't, you can't treat them when, you can't pre-treat for them. Just, it's not practical. All this information is in my book. If you haven't gone, you know, come up and gotten a copy of the book, please help yourself. Thank you for joining me for this presentation. If you're having problems with your lawn, call me for a free consultation, 850-939-9868. I just have this passion for taking unhealthy lawns, finding out what it's gonna take to make them healthy again. Father and Son has been taking care of my lawn since I installed it. I have people stop all the time and tell me I have the best lawn in Kelly Plantation. It's just incredible. So I would recommend Father and Son. As a matter of fact, people have stole my signs off the grass after you come and spray. So I think they want them for the number. I'm very happy with what Father and Son does. Call me today for a free consultation to find out how I can help you with your troubled lawn. 850-939-9868.